Good evening, Journal Club members. Uh, we are very privileged today to be joining in a wonderful discussion that has been actually in the daily. Uh, if any of you are journal club members, you will actually see an article that was written by our guest presenter today. And today we'll be talking just about that. So in a little while, I will be introducing our guest. But meanwhile, I would like all of you to Please introduce yourselves. Tell us in the chat your name, institution, research interest, as well as what you'd like to learn. Today's topic is Learning Factory, Mentorship for Research and Innovation. So we would like to know, we are curious to know what you would like to learn from this session. I'll tell you a little bit about Journal Club and then we will proceed. So the Journal Club is a space for early career researchers, emerging scholars, students, uh, majority who are currently postgraduate students and freelance researchers who join together to learn and grow through peer to peer support. So as one of the flagship programs of research mentorship, we host webinars like this where we invite guest presenters in order to learn and grow together. So if you're not a specialist in the field of ICT or engineering, do not worry, you're still in the right place. Our presenters are well aware that we are all coming in from different levels, fields of specialization, and I see Professor is already here. And I'm now going to introduce him and then welcome him. So keep introducing yourselves in the chat. So let me uh, tell you a little bit more about our presenter, Professor Engineer Sean Bosco Biringiro, a PhD in engineering, uh, is a university professor of mechatronics engineering, director of Siemens Mechatronics Certification Center. I'll say that again, Siemens Mechatronics Certification Center. He's the director at a university in Nyeri County called Dedan Kimadi University of Technology, Dekut. He's also a visiting researcher at University Bougogne French Comte um, in France. Prof. Jean Bosco is also registered as a professional mechanical engineer by the Engineers Board of Kenya, EBK, World Skills Kenya Mechatronics Expert, and he's certified as a mechatronics systems professional a designer by Siemens, which is a company in Germany. So Professor had a PhD in mechanical engineering. Area of specialization is micro or nano fabrication in South Korea, Yunnan University. He also holds a master of science in mechatronic engineering at Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology, JQUAT in Kenya, and a BSc in electromechanical engineering from the College of Science and Technology, University of Rwanda. So far sounding quite global. He also has a professional certificate of secondary education option, electromechanical ecole technique officiel de Muhima in Rwanda. So Prof has over 18 years of both industry and teaching experience. He supervised research or innovation projects at PhD, MSc and BSc levels, and he has published a considerable number of books and papers in peer-reviewed journals. I will not go ahead to read the profile, which is quite extensive, and there is a list of publications. He is a household name. If you just typed uh, his name on Google, you'd find him, and we were very glad to get this connection today. Uh, through one of our journal club members who I think will be joining us too. So at this juncture, I would actually like to invite Professor to begin his presentation. Please note your questions and comments in the chat. And then after which we will host a question and answer session. Um, I have no electricity in my house, but I will uh, switch my video off just to save power. And Dr. Carrie, Professor, you're very welcome. Uh, I, good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Am I audible? 
Yes, yes good evening, again. Dr. Harry. Yes, uh, I am Jean Bosco. As the, uh, Joyce has introduced with, uh, I think she introduced, I don't know whether what everything you said about me is only me or another person you are talking about, because it is too wrong. But we have tried to contribute. I don't say it is, I'm not talking about longer, but I'm talking about the, it is a little bit uh, uh, much more. You said I didn't know myself as I am such famous. Thank you. Uh, today, I wanted to present to you as uh, the topic I have, this is a running factory. But uh, before we go far, I say I am Jean Bosco, yes, as he introduced. Uh, I am uh, from Rwanda, but I work here at the Dan Kimada, director of Siemens Center. Uh, that is an international organization with Germany. Uh, Siemens Germany, many people uh, has idea about it. And uh, I have served as dean and also as a chairman of Mechatrons for uh, many years. Now, uh, where I am, I wanted to go directly make me presenter so that I can be able to uh, to, pre to share my screen, my screen so that I can tell you what I want to discuss with you. Uh, I don't, I, I don't know, I would not go much details in the technology, but I will talk about uh, the technologies so that uh, I believe uh, you see people from Kenyatta, I have seen somebody from Kenyatta University, I think last month I gave a presentation to the Kenyatta University, have you made me presenter? I'm waiting the Joyce to make me presenter. Oh, thank you. Let me let me ask Aurelia to do that. Thank you. Yes. So as I was saying, uh, we are in a in the village here in Nyeri. So uh, you can uh, we are near Mount Kenya. So if you have time, you can uh, visit us in Nyeri. Yeah, you are the co-host now. Yes. Now I can share my screen. Yes, you may. Oh, okay. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay. You can make it bigger. You can press F5. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if, I, yeah. if I, I can go to the first screen, so that uh, the first page, uh, so that we agree on uh, uh, or we look at whether what I'm saying, it makes sense uh, for you. Uh, when I talk about a learning factory, uh, no long time, maybe people has some terms, we need to see whether we understand those terms uh, in the same way. When you go to some university, they can tell you we are in the, we are in a workshop. Another person can say, I am in the lab. Uh, and now another person can say, I am in a running factory. A running factory is a new term, which is a, uh, Workshop, when we talk about a workshop, most of the time we are talking about maybe where first years and second years of the university goes to do uh, more less appropriate technology, uh, metal work and others for uh, mechanical or some work for electrical, I mean wiring and others, uh, civil engineering, maybe they go for con small construction. Uh, in the carpentry, they wanted to do some wood work that is what we call, we can call about uh, maybe a workshop. Mm -hmm. uh, but here we are talking about, we are moving and we say there's, there are labs. When it goes to maybe the fourth year and the fifth years and the masters and PhD, people, they talk about labs. Mm -hmm. But the discussion, uh, when you talk about a lab, you want it to mean is not industrial, uh, platform is the, a place where you tested the technology, then you can be able to tell in the, if industry are interested, they can be able to take that technology and uh, produce to industrial level. But the new trend of the technology is telling us, we have been teaching students in the workshop, we teach them in the lab, but we are using equipment which they can't find in the industry. So uh, what is the idea of running factory is now to bring the industry into the, in the university. That is why we have uh, our cement center and we have uh, started the running factory. Uh, the running factory is uh, a kind of Israel like lab, but now industry, let us say you have an, uh, uh, a research and development in industry, you have a department of research and development, and then you decide to donate that research and development to university. Many industries has research and development uh, places. So uh, what I'm discussing here, how can we use it? Uh, 
Hello. We will try to keep muting uh, so that we can be able to communicate. Uh, they, when I say this running factory, as I said, I am trying to say is a research and development, which is a university, it can be an industry, many industries, especially in Europe, they have uh, research and development in Kenya also, if you go to Kenya, Euro Kenya Power, you will find the Department of Research and Development, but those departments now, most of the time, the people working there are not necessarily uh, the engineers. I mean, not engineers, but the people who are the researchers. There are people who are employed in industry, but for one reason or another, they were transferred in uh, that department of research and development. For us, when we finished the industries, we realized that this is not a good idea. Let us come up with a, a different approach which is working for other countries, still it can work for us. So here I am the one on this table. I am trying to see, here we have what we call essential technologies. When we talk about essential technologies, there are many technologies we can talk about, but when we go to industrial 4.0, uh, some people call it the fourth industrial revolution. We look at the technologies which are enablers for us to be able to, to do transition from industrial 3.0 uh, to industry 4.0. I will explain to you what we call those, why, where, those in a, where those four come from, or how do we define this is four, how do we define this is three. Uh, if we go to these technologies, as I was saying, you will find some people talking about drones, the drone technology, like now in a country like Rwanda, they use drone for distributing of bread to people. If you go to blockchain, you will find many people open the groups for blockchain, we know cryptocurrency, but the blockchain is not only for cryptocurrency, uh, it is for also other work. Uh, we are talking about the big data, we have many people who are opening the data science and the working with Google, we're working with the Microsoft, uh, I mean IBM company uh, for big data. We have also the technology we call augmented reality, which is currently the new technology for industries. It means you need to, when you have this technology, you mean uh, when you wear the handset, like the one I'm wearing, if you see the machine, it can be able to be to see, give you some details of that uh, machine. If there is something you want, if there is a problem, it can also be able to transfer the data to somebody in the office somewhere. Uh, he can advise you or he can solve that problem if it is based on a network or something. Now we are talking about 3D printer uh, or 3D printing technology. This is again, we have been having what we call murding, where you have a murud if you want to make maybe, for example, a cup or you want to make a spoon or you want to make a plate. Uh, you have a murud which has the same shape as that uh, plate. But you use the murud when you are in mass production when you are doing too many things you want to produce for, for people, the consumers. But if you have a unique shape you want it to make, you go better to a 3D printer approach. There are many machines. You can do 3D printer dealing with the polymer materials, or you do 3D printer by using metals. So that is also another technology. Uh, we have Internet of Things. Everybody has been uh, hearing about Internet of Things, robotics, artificial intelligence virtual reality but now this virtual reality now is a kind of uh, technology which is in the same angle with the augmented reality this is what the news the article was talking about uh, but i wanted to discuss with you why do we do it and where do we want to go because that is the general idea uh, about this presentation. I wanted to see if you can, uh, we, if we agree on the problem, we may agree on the, the problem, but maybe the solution we may not agree, but me, my important part is to say, do we agree on the problem? If we agree on the problem, a uh, solution can be many, but we have to agree first of all on the problem. So I will explain how the, we are using the virtual reality, uh, how we are going to think about integrating robotics, artificial intelligence and others, but the discussion will not going to be much technology. The discussion is going to be no more application of the technology. Where do we need the technology so that we can see whether it's important to go to those technologies. Uh, uh, you want to move, 
uh, what I'm presenting, I wanted to prove to, to show to, to show to you uh, what we call proven success of industries. What do we call to, so far today? Everybody can say industry has, has, has there is a success of the industry, but at which level? How how do, do you explain? Maybe if you talk to your parent or to your uh, children or you are talking to people who are not engineer, how can you tell them there is a proven technology? I am talking about the transition from class to work. How do we do, how do we transit from class to work? Because that is also sometimes a challenge. Uh, and also we discuss industrial 4.0 technologies, uh, our current uh, project we are doing and what we think is a long road ahead. Maybe I go directly to, uh, to the proven technology or the success of the industries. When we look at this, we can see uh, uh, we can see a telegraph. A telegraph was invented in 1847 by uh, Mr. Wana uh, von Siemens. Uh, he built this pointer telegraph uh, so that it, it can be uh, it can be used for transferring some information if you wanted to transfer information the way we do with the phone and others. But the question is. Uh, here, if you look at this, there is no office, I think today you can find a, this kind of uh, equipment, I'm talking about this. Uh, I don't know, let me take a pointer. I think I think it's better if I use uh, the pointer, this is too small. Give me a second to see if I can get, uh, if I use, there's a, yeah, there's a pointer I think is bigger, is okay. So if you look at this, this, uh, maybe you can't find an office using this kind of communication with a phone like this. Today, you can find there are some offices in the ministry where you can find this kind of phones. Uh, if you go to some other places, maybe for example, sometimes when you find some offices which are based on ports and other places where you need to communicate to people, but in not the same office, you maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago, you are finding this phone. Today, almost everybody is using this phone among yourselves uh, because this is a smartphone. Maybe when you check in, uh, some of you, they have a smartwatch like this. Uh, some few people has this smartwatch. Uh, in the university, we have started to tell people in exam, you are not allowed to come with this smartphone, smartwatch. But the question we are asking whether we are, we are going to move from this smartwatch and then we go back where Siemens started. That is a question we ask when we try to say, is industry uh, succeeded or they have not succeeded? Because those are the questions. Uh, but here, if we look at this, this is a proven success because everybody, whether you somebody is an engineer or not, I believe he can agree with me in terms of electronics, in terms of communication, uh, uh, the people with electronics, with Android, they have tried their best to move a bit faster in comparison with the uh, other areas. Uh, now the question is, how do we, uh, if we look at this and we wanted to ask ourselves, Yes, there is industries. We are talking about industry 4.0. We are talking about industry 2.0. What is that? What is, which chair is that? Because many people uh, keep asking uh, those questions, but I wanted to make it a bit clear to you so that you understand with me and then we know how we, we transit to those uh, points if we want to move from industry 1.0. If you look at the 17th century in uh, uh, 1784, that is where people came up with the mechanization, use the steam power, and then you can be able to pump water, for example, from underground, and you pump it to the mountain, and then you can distribute in the city. Uh, definitely, this started a long time from uh, Italy, uh, because the people, the king in Italy around the 15th centuries, they are the people who tried to have and the Greeks who tried to have water and distribute water in the city uh, without using definitely motors because that time there were no electricity. So they were, contrib they were transferring or they were distributing this water by using this kind of pumps, which are mechanized. Uh, around the 1870s, 
that is where people like uh, Edson, uh, people like Vort, people like Ampia and others invented uh, electricity. That is the time of somebody like Edison invented the bulb, which we use today uh, to be able to have electricity and the uh, people like, uh, like Vort, as I said, and Ampia. So that was a revolution too where now you move from using those mechanization, the mechanical machines, and then you transfer, uh, you distribute the water in the city. But now you go and you say, let me have electricity. At least now during the night we can work. So that is, was a very good achievement by Edson and his team. Uh, then we moved around 1969, we moved to Industry 3.0. In industry 3.0, that is where we see robotics. That is where we have, say, we are talking about this ICT we are using. Uh, that is where we are talking about automation and computer and electronics. Then uh, industry 4.0, where we are today, which started around the 2013, 2014, uh, we are talking about the cyber physical systems. Uh, it means Internet of Things, it means really, uh, really space, really physical uh, machines or physical items in really space and the virtual machine in really space. So why do we need this? Or wh what do we say when we want? Because as we say, a student or a person needed to know this technology for, for one of the re one reason. Uh, there is a, an issue or there is a, a problem of this transition. The transition from industrial 3.0 to 4.0, there are many things you need to change because if you have systems which are based maybe on analog systems, you need, uh, you need to convert it to digital systems or you want to make a system to accept internet communication because you can't be able to send uh, information in the certain network if there is no internet communication. So this industry of 4.0, it refers to intelligent network or intelligent networking of machines and the processes. Uh, because you are helping, you want the help of communication and information technology. That is information technology, that is what we call ICT. So it means now, industry 4.0, you are trying to use ICT to make that machine a little bit intelligent and you want this machine to communicate. There is a lot of opportunities here in this industry 4.0, definitely for the suppliers and for the manufacturers. Uh, that is what I wanted to discuss with you. But uh, what is important, uh, there is a lot of expectation in the next five years, this technology related to industry 4.0, it may double or it may be triple because it is moving uh, very fast. But what do we need from the student? What we need from the student or from the user, the younger researchers, we need that understanding that transition. How do you get that transition? What is important is to learn what we call soft and hard skills. Because uh, if the industry in Europe or other places, they know, uh, there is no skills in a certain place they wanted to introduce the industries. For example, the Americans and the European learned that the Chinese has numbers and they decided to deploy the industry in China. Now today, because the Chinese, after they got the industries, they ran the technology of the Europeans, then they started to manufacture the same European are doing it. What is happening now? Uh, they, there is a, a war between the Europeans and the Chinese because uh, of that kind of technology, they think the Chinese now is moving very fast. That is the same strategy we need to use for our people. We equip them soft skills and hard skills because uh, one, you need to, as much as you can teach people programming and others, but you need to teach them also managerial skills because managerial skills are very important and they are not taught in class. If you go, in the university like where we are, and you are, they want to appoint you chairman of the department or dean of a school, there is no school that will take you to run to be a chairman. 
There is no school they will take, take you to learn how you, you read the people as a dean of the school. How do you de strategize? How do you do a strategic plan, business plan, and others? But now this you should write, maybe somebody from school of business should have had those kind of courses. But now again, in the university, we don't teach uh, hard programming. I mean, a lot of programming and codes. We teach the theories and the research and others. Because in examination, you don't enter most of examination with your laptop so that you can prove to people you're a good programmer. So that is what we wanted to stink to create this transition uh, from class to industries. We needed to have this learning factory, but we needed to equip students with soft and hard skills. But now, if you look at all these technologies we are talking about, uh, there is one technology which is a key. This technology, we call it the digital twin. When you go to the HR, if you go to the website of the HR, the HR, this one, which give us the parasail, if you want to take the parasail from Europe to here to Kenya and other places, you will realize the right, we use the digital twin. But the question is, what is the digital twin? Sometimes what the HR call digital twin? Is it the really digital twin Bosque is talking about it today? But we need to agree on uh, the properties. Uh, uh, what somebody can say, digital twin consists of what? What is make something or the system to be a digital twin? A digital twin has three parts. You need to have a physical product in real space. You need to have a physical product in real space. You need to have a virtual product in real space. And you have to have the connection of data and information. So it means what the HR is trying to explain, they are trying to say, yes, we have a factory. This factory has many asset, many equipment, and uh, there is a lot of physical assets. But what we are trying to do, we wanted to take this physical asset in a, in a cyber form, in a cyber space, so that what is happening in this physical can happen in a cyber space. So it means what the HR is doing is trying to say, if somebody, if the Aparacel reach at Mombasa airport, somebody in Nairobi must know this parasail has been picked by someone and is transferred to another location. So uh, where this is used, because there is a lot of uh, use for this digital twin, as I said, uh, here we are talking about it can be used in engineering. It means you can use the drawing, the documentation and others you need. You can use in operation, IoT sensors and others, and then you can have also the information section. It means this combine those three parts, engineering, which is the physical parts, and then the sensors, which can be the virtual uh, parts, and then you have the information. Now, for you to be able to visualize or to do this digital twin and you navigate, because we are talking about immersive, we want you to navigate in that virtual space. For you to navigate in the virtual space, that is where you need the virtual reality. That is what I was talking about in, uh, in the paper. The virtual reality, what do we need? If you wanted to, if you checked the first page, I was showing when I had the, this VR handset. This VR handset can help me to visualize this machine inside the computer, but I see it in a cyberspace. So I go back where I was. This, this, where do we need to use this digital twin? Because as I said, the HR is using it as a technology for them to be able to improve the service and have the data, but you can use it from initial planning of your plant. You can use it for the design of the commissioning and you can use it for the maintenance. So you have a lot of values uh, throughout the product life cycle. Whether you are starting to think about a product you wanted to produce, whether you are maintaining that machine or you are commissioning that machine. Most of you, you may find there are people from, from a business side who work in a procurement or who wanted to work in a procurement. If you want to work in a procurement, you need to do, you will spend a lot of time discussing with the people about the commissioning of equipment. Because first of all, you have to buy it. But when you buy it, you have to be sure because the government needed to pay, needed to pay on the delivery. Why, why this become a problem? 
if you go to company exhibit center or you go to BMW or you go to a Volkswagen or you go to Mercedes, they will tell you there is no car to sell. There is no single car to sell. You have to make order, you pay, then we sell a car to you. If you use the normal procurement approach, it will not work. But I can give you another example for this virtual, this digital twin. Imagine somebody like uh, Cristiano Ronaldo or somebody like Messi or somebody like Mbappe. This guy has a lot of billions, but he wanted to buy an aeroplane. You know, he will not go to visit his friend to see his aeroplane he has, and then he buy that aeroplane. Imagine if you own a company and you want to sell that aeroplane to Mr. Mbappe. You know, you cannot make that aeroplane just to wait for Mbappe to come to buy. You can't make an aeroplane to wait for Cristiano Ronaldo to come to buy. You need to convince him to buy it. You need to convince him to design it for him. But how do you convince him? This guy is not an engineer. You can't go to tell him in a three dimension and you show him the drawings and you explain it to him. This guy, what he need? He need a digital twin. He needed to immersively enter in that plane and he can navigate inside and he can feel, has the feeling of that aeroplane. If he has the feeling, he can decide to buy it. That is what we are talking about here when we are talking about another side of digital twin, but goes to virtual reality. I will show you the a virtual room. Uh, so, but the basic idea uh, of this digital twin remains to be a dynamic uh, virtual software generated representation of a corresponding physical asset or physical processes. There are definitely many applications, as I said, you can use it in uh, research, in uh, innovation, because application is keeping growing. The benefit, you want to improve the efficiency, because as I said, you can't make this system and you operate in a way uh, like you wait for somebody to, uh, to give order, that is why in this government, for example, in the Kenya government, if you want to buy a machine and you go through the procurement process, you check the days of uh, somebody, uh, you know, you will have to launch uh, open a tender, people will tender, then you will go to evaluate. When people start to evaluate, finish evaluation, you send the machine, train the staff and so forth. What happened if you import a machine in 2021, it will arrive to you in 2023. Uh, that is the challenge we have. Even for now, as a university, the machine we have imported before COVID, they have not yet arrived because of the procurement. If you are talking about something of 1,000, 2,000, that is okay. But if you are talking about something of 10 million, 15 million, it will take many years. The machine we imported, in 20, uh, maybe 2012, arrived here in 2014 towards 2015. And some of them still are still in the commission processes. I'm saying yesterday, I was discussing with the, the chairman of civil engineering, the committee from Africa Development Bank was coming to the university to commission a machine which was bought in 2012. So imagine somebody procure a machine in 2012, uh, he has used his money in 2012, and then in 2021, you are still coming to see whether the machine can do what it's supposed to do. Uh, it means uh, that person will lose money. That is that what it means. And that process is not efficient. I think if you're in the business and somebody has your one million for 10 years, I don't know how much money he can pay, he can pay you. That is the challenge. So it means the product, the quality, because you can be with the digital twin, you can be able to test the product clearly. And also the short, the shorter and planned downtime, it will be reduced because you will understand the machine before you are importing it. And the, during the maintenance, if the machine has a problem, I think you had yesterday with the, not yesterday, but the day before yesterday with the Mark Zuckerberg, with the Facebook, they have lost 7 billion, 6 billion. So how do you lose 76 billion in a day? If you are a poor, if you have, that was only the business you are running, I think you are done because uh, if your system goes down and you take, if, imagine if that system Facebook took uh, maybe six months, I don't know where we were, <laughs> how the communication will be for us. It should have been very difficult to us. But now if I go to this, when I talk about this, some engineers, uh, are tempted to all not non-engineers to think what I'm talking about here 
has no difference with the CAD, with the computed design, which we use in civil engineering, or we use in electrical, we use in mechanical, we use in different areas. But there is a big difference. When we look at this house, you wanted to build a house for someone. What do you show this person? You will show him, this is the house, but you will tell him, okay, with this house, I will give you uh, the internet connection, and then this is the design of the house and the other documentation you will need. But if you wanted to take it to the digital twin during the planning so that this person will understand what you're talking about, the very first thing you need to say, for me to achieve the difference between a digital twin and the CAD model, I have to have two ways communication. So it means the physical, which is the physical needed space, and the virtual must communicate. That is the very first, uh, excuse, excuse, excuse. Don't make noise, OK. Uh, sorry, I was a bit disturbed, but it's OK. So what I was saying is you need to have two ways communication. Another thing you need to say, you have to have that virtual model. Because here you have this virtual model, you need to reshape it, and you add daily time operation data. So it means you need to have uh, the data communication, the wireless communication, or another system of communication. You need to have the machine running. Then when you take this and you take the really operation with the data and you take the algorithm and the machine running part of data, it means you can have a digital twin building. So it means all this information about this building, about the status, about the people inside the building, about the maintenance of the machine, you can have them in your laptop. So what can make this to happen is because you took this building and you added the time operation or data and you added the machine running so that you can be able to train the data and you can be able to send this data, for example, in the cloud so that you can be able to have them where you are. So one part is, it means what is happening to this building should happen in your computer. So where you are seated, whether you are in the office, what is happening in your house, should, you should see it in real time. That is, or when you wanted to do something to that house, maybe you have a fridge, you want to switch off or switch on or do some switch on light and so forth. Maybe some people, you may have young children and when you, they are at home, they don't study, they just watch TV. But for you, you can be knowing what is happening in your house. And then you can be saying, maybe my children has finished uh, to do homework. Now this is the time for them to relax, watch TV for 10 minutes or uh, 20 minutes, maybe this time of news and so forth. You have all those information from your building keeping coming to you. But another thing is the security uh, of your house. Again, it's very important. You need to keep checking. But another part of this, you need to reshape the virtual, uh, this virtual uh, prototype and provide it to uh, the manufacturer with a smart, uh, information of, about the new product you are looking for. Because also, as much as you tell the manufacturer, you need also to know, you need to do uh, the, the, the fabrication without losing materials. Because if you just, it is, if you started to do fabrication of a certain product without having a twin of it, you have a problem of cost because this person will cost charge you a lot of money because he may be he will may need to keep repeating uh, the process. He do the, he does the process and he keep repeating it. Another distinction is you, when you use this digital twin, it can give you information about the product life. Uh, management because when you are trying to say I am trying to make a certain product or I'm trying to like the same I am building or I have a car I can have a status of my machine at each step every step I have the information the last part we can say you can have a pool of data about the department, for example, if you have a university like Deda Nekimadi where we are seated, or you have a plant, or you have an industry, you can have information at each stage. It means you can have information about the sales, you can have information about the marketing, you can have information about the logistics, supply chains, and others. Because what do you want? You want it to have a data-driven system. So it means that is on why when you ask some people uh, from other countries like Europe, they will tell you uh, today, 
uh, data are, are equally important as petrol. So it means maybe it's for the years to come. That is why you find the Google has employed many people from this side. Why Google has employed many people is because Google wanted to know the data about Africa. Because if Google has the data about Africa, has data about each individual, that is the same job Facebook is doing, that is the same, the same job the Zoom is doing, because when we are discussing this, Zoom will record it and will keep it. You, you will record it thinking you are the one who recorded it for your use, but Zoom will also record it. So it has people who will, who will, at one point, they have people who will analyze those data whether are important, how many people attended that meeting, uh, why they attended, what was maybe the topic, very basic information which can help them. This is the same. Uh, you can find in the university, somebody is having money of, from Google, maybe to know the sound of birds or sound of animals, because they wanted to know whether these animals are still existing. So because those are the data they are looking for. If those animals still existing, maybe they know there is a certain medication which can come from the, maybe the skin of that animal. So if we find that animal is still existing in Africa, because in Europe, maybe the animals cannot survive uh, because of the weather and so forth. Uh, this is the digital twin part. I wanted to show you when you have this digital twin and you want to commission a machine, how do you go about it? I want you to keenly watch this. Uh, keenly, I wanted you to watch this video. Uh, let me remove this. Uh, I think I need to. Uh, let me see how I can run this video. I think I have to remove the printer. There is a printer. Okay. Uh, I want you to watch this video, Kennedy. I repeat it again. This video is in the inside. This is inside the laptop. Here we have the laptop and here we have the physical machine. But what we are trying to say, we wanted to see if that is simple work piece, if it moves here, even the one in the laptop move at the same time. That is the starting point of the digital twin. You wanted to see whether the physical machine, what it is doing, is the same as the virtual machine is doing. If this was, yeah, I think you have seen this. Now, why are we saying, am I, am I showing you this? I'm trying to show you, if you wanted to commission the machine, you don't need necessarily to have that machine where you are. You can have that machine in your laptop and then somebody switch on that machine where he is, whether he's in Italy, whether he's in Germany, where he's in Japan. It means you can be able to know whether this machine can do what I want. So it means uh, today, if you are in Kenya and you want to buy a car, you have to check a friend who has that car so that you go and you test it when you find it's good. But if you want to buy a car and it is the new car, very new, nobody else has bought this type of a car. You have a lot of challenge, but with the digital twin, you can tell the manufacturer, I want me to see that car when you are driving it. I want to see how the speed change. I want to see how you accelerate. I want you to see how much forces you are using and many things you wanted to get the data about that machine. So it means uh, this digital twin can be used in a different era in a wide range of application. Uh, as I said, this wide range of application I was talking about, let me bring again the uh, there is a pointer. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, you can use it for different job. You can use it for design and adjustment because you don't need to build a car. Then when you finish to build it, you realize there is a mistake. Uh, you restart it. You have to do adjustment before you put it to the uh, real life. I mean, to, to put it in the physical. Again, instead of commissioning uh, the machine, the physical machine in the physical world, you can commission that car before it leaves Japan. You can commission uh, many systems, you can test, you can verify, you can do all those jobs. But why do you need this? Is because implementation of virtual commission, of physical commissioning of machines and cars and others is a bit of time consuming and it is uh, a cost, uh, it is expensive because when you wanted to commission a machine, 
somebody who when when you guys where you work or where you find yourself every day you will realize maybe one day you want to buy a, a big machine or a new machine and somebody tells you they will send a technician or they, they, they will send an engineer who will come with the machine to help you to commission it. It means to test it and the train the stuff and so forth. But with this technology, because when you look at this person coming from USA, you have to put him in a certain hotel, you pay that hotel and so forth. It is part of the cost you have to occur, which to incur, which is not necessary. So there is also time consuming for that, as I said. Uh, issue of hand, handover of that equipment, usually, in the, as I said a uh, few minutes ago, we have a machine we bought in 2012, but it still is under commissioning processes because of handover issues, saying, okay, this doesn't work, this works, and so forth. Again, the controllers can be integrated. Uh, if you look at if there are some bugs they found, they can be fixed. If there are procedures, they return the papers. You, need, you know, there's a lot of paperwork in, uh, in, in the commissioning of machines. Uh, also, yeah, let me say the commissioning itself is a challenging phase because as much as the paperwork and the people to come when the machine has arrived, people take it from where it is at the port, bring it to you. Sometimes you have some problem on that machine, you wanted to install it, you have no information. So it means at the end of the day, this person, like this person who supplied the machine to the university for 10 years ago and he has not got any money, he may find himself leaving the business. So how can you assist that person? That is where we talk about the technology. But now, how do we accelerate this technology to the market? Because that is an issue. Uh, if you look uh, region-wise, uh, if you look at you go to North America, you realize this uh, digital twin, uh, they are expecting by 2027, this technology will be having around 15,000, 15 billion US dollars. If you go to Asian Pacific, you find in 2027, they will be having also around that amount of money. But if you look at it today, versus the globally, this is supposed to increase by 35%. We are talking about between 2021 and 2027. Those are the, uh, the mathematics. How this is going to penetrate the market? Because if you look at 2020, the digital twin was bringing income of around 5 billion US dollars because this is a new technology which has been uh, there for us the three years. Uh, the first digital twin for us we made in the university, we made it in 2019. 28, around the 2018, 2019. Uh, but many people today, they are talking about it this year and the last year. When you look at internet penetration, is going to help this digital twin to move very fast because we are talking about the technologies like we have the smartphone ourselves. So it means if you have a smartphone, you can be able to visualize this product. This will allow us to be able to uh, to accept or to use this technology. I am talking about uh, the uh, artificial intelligence, that is AI. We are talking about machine learning. We are talking about the blockchain. All those technology, ranging definitely from automotive to aviation, are going to fuel again the industrial growth for this uh, digital twin. But also there are many, uh, there are many uh, advantage or the benefit of this digital twin uh, because you are able to speed the process. Uh, if you look at it, the challenge which is still there, but uh, which still is going to change is people thinking this digital twin is for electrical and for mechanical engineers because they think uh, this technology start with the 3D design of a mechanical concept. Uh, then you go to electrical for wiring of the machine, and then you go to automation for mechatronics and the PLC programming and the configuration. But this is not really for mechanical engineers. This is for everyone. It depends on which business you are doing. For, engineer, for machines, yes, you start with the mechanical, three card, the, the computer department for programming and others, and the ICT. But generally, if you ask the HR, what they are doing with the digital twin has nothing to do with the mechanical, has nothing to do with electrical. It's just the data. So it can be a data driven. Uh, the, another advantage of this uh, penetration, if what will accelerate it, is because this allows engineers to work in parallel. It means you can press an order. While the order is being pressed, you started to train your staff. So it means you will not, you will eliminate that part 
of saying you will need staff, you will need to commission the machine when it has arrived. So when you are on paperwork, already you have placed an order and the machine is being manufactured. If you look at this technology as a rift for the virtual commissioning, because what is important, as I said, you need to look at a traditional approach. Our traditional approach was to go, you order the machine, they assemble this machine, they program it, and then they go to site to commission it. But in this, with the new approach, the assembling will be having the digital model and the virtual commissioning. You will finish it during the assembling process. When you are assembling this machine in the industry where it is, you can be able to train the staff. Then the, the really commissioning will come immediately because you will not have the, the big part of commissioning and the training people physically. So if you look at it, this is going to change because in a in manufacturing environment, you will be having a replicate, a replicate of that uh, uh, a replica of that machine. Another thing is saying the this virtual commissioning, if you look at this. Uh, you look at the reading virtual uh, the commissioning, you have a lot of rows from this point to this point, you have a lot of rows. So it is assumed like 20% is what you will use for just the commissioning. This means if you wanted to program that machine, uh, it means you will program it virtually. It means you can be able to remove the bugs and other things, issue of codes. And the technical, actually, you can know the technical problems of that machine in advance before even you buy it. You can make a decision whether you buy it or not. Other things you can be able to, if you look at this commissioning, as I said, it can decrease uh, the cost you use for commissioning of this machine. And you can get a better quality because for you, you have rented the machine before you made a decision. Sometimes I say this because most of our, our friends, they have not maybe been in Europe. When he wanted to go to Europe, he said everything he has, and then he take a flight, he go to Europe. When he arrived in Europe, he realized Africa is better than this place. What happened to this person? He can't come back because already he sold all, everything he has. But if you took this person, maybe you, you used this kind of technology, you put him immersively, you show him how Europe is, how supermarket in Europe look like, how uh, life is, how people cook their food, how they go to supermarket, how the weather is. Then this person make a decision before he said his product, everything he has, and then he goes there, and then you find your friend telling the people they tell you, you know, the guy was in a, in a fifth floor, and he decided to jump. Then you ask why this guy was having a good life. He was in Europe. Why he jumped, and so forth. Now I want to show you what we are doing ourselves. I want you to watch this video again, keenly. Uh, we have the machine here a virtual machine and a physical machine. I want you to watch this keenly. Uh, uh, this machine is an, in a virtual room. Uh, we wanted to try this. The, the other part of the machine is a physical machine. This is only physical, the part on the, on the right, and the part on the left is a virtual. Uh, if you try to, if you, you run the physical machine, this is physical, it, you can command it by using the virtual. Let us try to do it. You go and you switch this solenoid on, you will see this ramp go on. You go to this, you see another ramp go on. You go to this, then you can see the machine has started to pump water. So it means anywhere you are, when this physical machine is working, this virtual machine also is working. If you want to switch off, you can still switch off. So it means uh, with uh, in the university where we are teaching, because you are still switching off the machine, you can switch off when you are in your computer at home, or I can bring the video again if you you wanted to uh, review it. Uh, somebody can be at home the same way we are here. Then you start this machine. Then your student can be able to do experiment to see because this is based on a program. This is pure is more or less engineering. But what we are doing with this machine, we are trying to set a certain pH because uh, we wanted this machine to be working in Jodamo, where you are drilling in a certain forest, and you wanted to see the data from the a certain where you have drilled in Jodamo. Uh, this will make a little bit less expensive. 
uh, because uh, if you do this work, it means you don't employ many engineers and many four, four drive cars to keep going to the site to see what is happening to the machine. That is why you can be able to switch on the machine virtually without touching the physical machine. Uh, another step is a virtual lab. This is what I was again discussing in the paper. This is this is start with the just this is start with a kind of gaming. But when you, you look at it, I don't know whether you hear this his sound. If you don't hear, I can continue. He's trying to navigate inside this virtual lab. He in the lab you have the robots, you can be able to navigate inside. You are somewhere, you go to the, the tools on the table. Now you then in this workbench, you can be able to use the tools which are there. Then you can have the PLCs I was showing. These are the controller for engineers. This is a virtual lab I'm talking about. You can find the machine inside. You can go near the machine. You can switch them on. You can switch off. Then you can also. So this is station we have it in the university. We have this robot in the university, but now we can have it also virtual. So you can also navigate. You can see in that virtual lab we have also a certain room with the people photos and others. You can still go in another room. You can go here. We are making ventilators. So he's trying to go to the room of a ventilator where you have a room and somebody can be sleeping in that bed if he's sick. Then you have a. Uh, you can in that room before you go to ventilator. You see another machine. That this is the machine. The other machine I didn't show you. But this machine does uh, thermal control. This is a process I was showing you previously. Then you can come and you run about this machine, many things about the machine. I mean, somebody can use it for different use. You can go now to another room and you can see in this another room, this is the hospital room. Then you will find somebody and you can get your data about this patient anywhere you are. Definitely, it is, it is made for medical doctors. Because when you have this, whether you are at home, you can know if you have your person sick and you agree with the doctor, you can be seeing the situation without necessarily going to hospital. So it means this data, you can see them. If you check here, he can be able to see the lung and he can be able to go to to the to the debug and again then he can start the system and he can see the data if you check kidney he can be able to push that button and then he can see all the data about on really time about a certain patient the patient we are we are discussing if you see this data are the, are still moving for the ventilator this is the ventilator we designed this is the idea i wanted just to discuss with you uh, wow, now. we are learning so much. Yes, yeah, yes. Let me finish. Yeah. Let me, let me yes. finish. Okay. Okay. So uh, what I wanted to say, maybe to finish, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, the a long road to go because there is a long journey. There is a, a really a long, a long road ahead. Why do we think there is a long, a long road ahead? Is it because uh, there is an issue of standard. When we are talking about digital twin, uh, we are talking about the virtual commissioning, the virtual reality. What is the standard? Because this is a new technology. Everybody will implement it almost in his, his own way. I was part of the people developing standard for Africa for this industry 4.0. We have finished the document. We sent it to African Union. I believe they will launch it uh, next year. Uh, I mean, they will have to discuss to agree whether this is standard is good, we can follow it or not. Uh, but the other issue is integration of information technology, because there are a lot of discussion of integration and ICT or IT information. There is also a problem of uh, operationalization of those technologies. I'm talking about, again, there is a lot of issues when we are talking about uh, digital twin versus virtual commissioning versus IT versus, uh, versus uh, operationalization technology, what is ICT and so forth. Another thing is some people think this is for mechanical people, I said before, uh, for you to be able to do this, this needs mechanical and automation expertise, but this is not, 
what it means for digital twin. All of the starting people are engineers, but everybody else can be able to find his way. Uh, again, other things, as I said, people are tempted to think these are a domain for mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. And also there is another issue of culture and institution workflow because uh, most of the time people to change the ideas is a bit difficult. That is the reason why uh, there is a problem of the collaboration because we need to foster the collaboration between the uh, virtual, uh, what we are talking about the virtual commissioning and the digital twin to make sure that uh, very many people understand what we are talking about. Then again, the last point is many industries, when you visit European industries, others, they are talking about this digital twin, they are talking about this technology, artificial intelligence, but the customer who are ourselves, we are still not yet sure about these technologies. So now those are the challenge ahead. We need ourselves to understand this. When our people understand this technology and they get all ideas, they can be able to have uh, to navigate inside this kind of road we have. My last slide is uh, about our partner. We have uh, uh, in Kenya, we definitely collaborate with the Kenjin, Kenya Power and others. Uh, in Europe, we have Siemens, Volkswagen and other people. Then in the ministry, we have Ministry of Public Works because we believe you can't do this yourself. You need to form really alliances. Thank you so much. This is our website. This is where we are. I took so long time to explain to you. I don't know whether what I said is relevant to you or, but I hope you understood. Maybe I communicated. I have been talking, but I wanted to hear whether I was communicating or just talking. Thank you so much. Thank you so much also. And from the chat, I can see you are really communicating because we have a host of comments. Somebody requests the presentation. So we will be availing this recording and that is all right. You'll be able to access it. So we have Ahmed Abi asking, Professor, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Let me ask you a question. What is the difference between digital dread and digital twin? And kindly, Tell us what challenges do digital twin solve in academic learning? Thank you. Uh, then we have another you, question. Before you oh, go far, yeah, yeah. I yeah. wanted to go one by one, it's better yeah. so that we. Yeah. He said digital twin and? Digital thread. Digital thread, digital, I don't. Okay, I think he, we can request him to tell us, but the, uh, maybe I can talk, because I know the digital twin, but I'm not getting the digital thread, unless he write it, he wrote in the comment. Yes, you're welcome to, to unmute Ahmed and just explain the digital thread, please. Ahmed, can you hear us? I'm not sure if you can hear us. Uh, yeah. I think let's proceed to the next one. Uh, and he's also asking um, about the difference between the digital, what the digital right. twin can contribute. Yes, to academic learning, the digital yes. thing. Yeah, that is, a, that is a very important question. And uh, uh, when you look at academia, we are uh, many universities. It may not have actually not many too many i can say in kenya maybe equipment we have in dead and kimadi we are lucky we go to we have this big number of machines we can run experiment physically with the student but you find maybe in the lab the machine i showed you what i was showing you for digital twin we have that simple machine one single machine which should be touched by 1000 student so how this 1000 student will touch this machine in a period of, because a, a class must go the whole week, the whole, I mean, every week, student will do for a semester. But this student has to go to theory class and the practical class. But now, if you want to teach this student to know the details of this machine, when we are trying to calculate with your eyes, maybe a student has only four minutes on this machine. Every student has a maximum of four minutes to use that machine. If you say every student will have his free time to that machine, which most of the time is not possible. So it means what we are trying to solve, we want a student to have this machine in a virtual platform. He needed to have it as a digital machine. 
Why you need to have a digital machine? It is like you have a library, you have many books in a library, but the space people to sit is too small. How do you solve that problem? You need to give soft, soft books to people. So we are trying to go to give soft machine to people, but not in a CAD platform, not a static machine. We give you a dynamic machine. So it means for you, what we need is to give you time when it, other people are not using the machine, you, you can be able to use the machine. You can repeat it, you not necessarily only need time, but you can do what the machine can do. You can operate it, you can understand more details. It is like when you read a book which is in a soft, it becomes easy for you because you can go to the page 1000, you go back to the page 700, but if it is a physical book, you need to keep uh, going to each page so that you reach to what you want to read. Sometimes you go to the book and you click the keyword. What do you want to know whether this keyword is in this book or not? But if it is a physical book, you don't have an option. This is the same for these machines. We are trying to tell people we can change the way we have been believing for somebody must touch a physical machine so that he understand. But now a few minutes ago, I was with my student. I told him usually when we do experiment, when I start the machine, you have used your ears to see if it has gone on or not. But we are bringing another angle. Also, you see with your eyes, you will hear and you will see the car has changed. If the motor goes on, the car will change. Even if that motor is not made to change the car. In a physical platform, it doesn't change the color, but in a virtual, it can change the color. If we send, if we start it, we can show it has started. Even if something doesn't rotate, we can make it rotate. So that if it rotates inside, but you can't be able to see how it is rotating, we can show you uh, on real time how it is rotating. If we, we are trying to teach people to stop to believe, to teach stopping believing, but understand what is happening. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. That's well said. And then Japheth Nieno of Tibet Authority asks uh, a simple question. In basic terms, how do we define industry 4.0? And he says, thank you, Prof, for the wonderful presentation. OK, uh, this is an interesting question. I am trying to see. Uh, we can say industry 4.0 in the in a really in easy term, uh, maybe to an engineer, uh, he can understand in a form of uh, system which is going to help us to deal with the physical and the cyber space on a really time. We have a physical machine and we have what we can call it virtual, but let us call it cyber. We are talking about something which is not, you can't touch it, but you want it to have both the physical which you can touch and you have the twin the part the other section of it which look alike then you have the communication in it so for you to be able to achieve industry 4.0 you need the physical machine you need the virtual machine and you need the communication it means you need two ways communication the physical and the virtual together so why do we do this we allow people to think whether you need the physical or you need the virtual. So industrial 4.0 is trying to tell us, choose what you want. Do you want the physical or you want the virtual? But the physical and the virtual are the same. So you, you can opt. If I say, if you have a physical book, another guy has a virtual book. I think all of you, you have books. Yeah. Uh, sometimes the person who has the virtual book has more advantage than somebody who has the physical book. So in a, what Jaffet is saying, in industry 4.0, we can look at it now is a combination of the physical and the virtual. Industry 3.0 was much focusing on ICT, which is a part of the virtual part. But industry, you are trying to take one, industry one, industry two, and industry three, you put them together, you put a plus. One industry one plus industry two plus industry three, it become industry four. But in a simple term, is a physical machine and a virtual machine, you introduce communication. That is how you can define industry 4.0. I don't know, Jafet, whether I, am, I have answered you. Jafet? You did excellently. Thank you. Thank you, Jafet. <laughs> thank you for attendance as well. Thank you. Thank you. We work, with, we work closely with Jafet. He's really... Jafet is really one of the people we have here in Kenya who are critical thinkers.
because uh, he's championing a lot of activities here if it goes to word skills but he's a key person in a uh, tivet in tivet i mean in tiveta so because they coordinate all the tivet institution but really he's a person i have seen uh who really push these technologies to move and move very fast i have seen you are you are keeping pushing, uh, I think, uh, Jafet for is also for the word skills, the MOUs and others. Thank you so much. Yeah, we are so honored to have you here. Then we have David who says, nice session, Prof. Is there a similarity between digital twin and Internet of Things? Also, say something yes, about yes, that. Yes, 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 yes. Because that is, uh, as I was presenting and I was showing, uh, you can't differentiate, you can't separate digital twin and internet of things because uh, the digital twin cannot work without uh, this communication, this kind of two-way communication. When you talk about internet of things, it is helping you two-way communication because you have one part, uh, one physical part somewhere and you wanted to get it, uh, you needed to get information on it at time. So the digital twin is about combination of artificial intelligence, combination of internet of things, uh, wireless communication, and then you can be able to achieve that. So the digital twin is allowed, I can say, all of this technology, when you look at the internet of things, artificial intelligence, these are the technology which was the enablers for the fourth industrial uh, revolution. So those ones were defined initially in industrial three. Uh, now we are in industry of four. Now industry of four, they became enabler. So it means you, when you talk about industry of four, you don't forget industry of three. So all the technologies we are talking about, they are in four, but enablers are in three, artificial intelligence and so forth. And uh, I'm talking about internet of things and that. I showed in my first, in my first slide. I, when I was presenting my first slide, I showed the technologies. I don't know whether, uh, uh, I can bring the slide again very fast. Yes, that is okay. As you also say something about augmented reality. Yes, because when I was uh, presenting this, I was trying to show for you to achieve the digital. Here I have not talked about the digital twin because the digital twin will help us to Im immersively uh, enter the virtual platform and navigate and control the physical machine. For us to be able to control the physical machine, we need internet of things. But for us to be able to get the data and train the data, we need artificial intelligence. That is why uh, robotics, definitely we can have it as part of the, the digital twin can control a robot, can control different systems, can control drones. I think if people, it was not a digital twin that time, I don't know how we can define it, but uh, there are many processes, there's many operations the US does, but we don't know uh, so far whether they use the same technology or they use different technology. But if you, you launch like a rocket, you need to see the status of that rocket from starting to the end. Yes, mm -hmm. you, Joyce, you wanted to talk about yes. the augmented reality. Augmented. Yes, uh -huh. mm. Yeah, say something about augmented reality. Yeah, uh, what I can say about augmented reality, let us understand it. Uh, you understand the augmented reality when you compare with the uh, virtual reality. Virtual reality, I have. I am in a virtual platform. I wanted to access a physical machine. In augmented reality or a physical system, in augmented reality, I have a physical system and I wanted to make the people on a virtual platform to get information about this physical system. It means you can use it in maintenance. Let me give a simple example. Uh, when the teacher give a homework to children at school, the children will come and communicate the homework to the parent, right? But yeah. if you use augmented reality, you can be able to say when the teacher wanted to communicate a certain type of homework, he will just put a small stamp on that paper. When I, the child arrives home, I will take my smartphone and I take, I take, I direct the camera to that, that stamp the teacher has put. Like now the same way you go to supermarket, uh, then when you put in the phone, it will tell you what the teacher wanted the child to, to solve. Instead of the child to carry many books, the child can carry just one single paper. 
But when he arrived home, you, you put the phone on that single paper at every, what I can call it, like a, a QR code or a, a barcode. Then you can be able to see in a form of a video or in a form of class notes or in a form of 3D design, what the teacher wanted this child to do. It means even a teacher can send you on WhatsApp a certain image, but when you take it and you, you, direct, you take it to the virtual to augment the reality, you can be able to see what the teacher wanted the child to do. So it means we are augmenting. It means there is a reality we are not able to see, but we are trying to increase it to make it to be seen or to be understood. But this okay. is working in maintenance. It means you, you go to industry, you can look at a certain machine, it has a certain problem, but when you look at it with your specs or you use your phone, it can transmit the data about that machine to the, an engineer who is not specifically in that site. So it means augmented reality, you are on the site, you want to transmit the data to reach to somebody who is in a virtual. In virtual reality, you want to take the data with which are in virtual, and then you want to send it to the physical machine. So that is the augmented reality becomes simpler than the virtual reality. Virtual reality is more difficult. That is why for us, we spend a lot of time in virtual reality than augmented reality. I have my student doing a project on augmented reality, but uh, I wanted first of all to, to go in a cyberspace, we communicate with the physical system. Because to communicate, to have a physical system and you communicate with a virtual space, it doesn't become too difficult. I don't know whether I'm communicating. Yeah, I think that is clear. Um, mm. I hope you're well answered. Okay, okay. Right, so those then, are, mm. then James requests the PowerPoint presentation slides. I, and uh, <laughs> yes, I will yeah. put the I will put the part the, the, the slide on our website. Uh, wow. immediately after this, I will request the ICT team to put this on the website. Uh, the you. website I showed you, you will yeah. be able to access this yes. PowerPoint. You will go to this yeah, website. Very, if you go to, to our well. mm -hmm. if you go to our university website, you can be immediately see if I let me show you how you go to our center very fast. Yeah. When you when you are on the university website, the KUT dot AC dot KE. If you do just, uh, I wanted to, sh I don't know whether I'm sharing, let me see, I can share, let me share my screen. Yes. Uh, this is a university, this is university website. When you're on the university website, yes, you do www.dkut.ac.kenya. The very first page up there, you will see a uh, semen center. When you click there, you can see the page I was showing you. Now here, today, when you see it, you will find uh, the VR. I don't know whether you are seeing the page. Are you seeing the page? Yes, yes we can see the screen, yes. You can see the screen. These are our, our students. We have many students, uh, international students. This is Ambassador of France who visited us uh, this entry. We have many people keeping visiting Kenjin and other people. So we have a page. We put all the information people may need. Uh, what facilities are there, what we have in physical, and what we have in virtual. Uh, we have also information about VR. So somebody can come and read about VR, understand what we are doing in the lab. This is where I'm seated, actually. I'm seated in the same place. So oh, okay. <laughs> how we navigate. Uh, uh, because in the virtual lab, you don't need to have, we can have a million of machines in a small lab. That is what we are trying to do. Okay. And the yeah. last question is from Perry Susitia. Have you done any virtual commissioning that's commercial in the country yet? Uh, so far, we have not yet done it. That is the mission we are given by the university because uh, as I said previously, understanding of the technology, what we are pushing now is people to understand the technology. I have a kind of discussion with the Ministry of Public Works uh, because we have been training them. Now they want to come for us to teach them how they will be doing virtual commissioning and the World Bank uh, funding. Uh, so that after they learn how to do virtual commissioning, they will start to be commissioning their machines. You know, Ministry of Public Works are the ones who are making roads 
I am talking about Tika Road, Mombasa Road, not Mombasa Road, but much Tika Road. Uh, they hire machines. You may find even Mombasa Road, their machine, their machine was hired there because their machine are hired by many people. Not necessarily Ministry of Public Act to make road, but the machine are hired. So we wanted to tell them if they want to buy a machine, they can be commissioning them because those are very expensive machines. Wonderful. Yeah, that is what we are doing. We are in negotiation with them, but more or less the deal is not far. Okay. So yeah. Barry also says thank you, Prof. So Doris Njokai has a comment. Prof, you have done an amazing job. We need more of these sessions. So I'm getting from the chats that we want more and more. We want to learn more and more of this. I've been able to follow, um, even if I'm not a specialist in this field, because you explained to us very, very um, methodically, and we've gotten, you know, uh, the basics of um, what all this is about. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. I'm not sure if there are any more questions. Oh, I see just comments, just appreciating. Uh, Mwangi saying, I have been attempting to have a commercial level of Internet of Things. This has really helped. So this was a very wonderful session. We appreciate your presence. Uh, we were honored by your uh, joining us. And we apologize for the hitches at the beginning. Uh, but you took your time to actually, and more than, more than what you, we had asked for, to really explain this to us. We were glad also for the connection uh, through Michael at Decud uh, to have you come to be with us. Mm -hmm. Perry says, thank you. This is very necessary, especially in this era of COVID-19. Yes, I was actually thinking, I'm in the health sector. I was just thinking about how I can use this innovation for my own uh, work as a clinician. Jafez uh, says, I think you can give a lecture to our Tibet trainers on this kind of disruptive technologies. I think that would yeah. be a wonderful discussion to continue with Jafet. And Perry says it would be interesting to learn the challenges once you launch the virtual commissioning. So yeah. I think I'll give it back to you to just close and then we call it a day. Thank you. So yeah, much. thank you so much, Jafet. We are, this is sometimes we have, we need to keep talking to people having this information shared. Because this technology is really very important for the TV institution and for young engineers, uh, because this is uh, more or less is cheap in terms of the money you invest, but is intensive in terms of the knowledge you need to have. But it is not a problem to us because as Africans, as I said previously, uh, China is doing what is doing because of numbers, not because the Chinese had a lot of money previously. What they had is numbers, and then it since the Europeans realized that these people has numbers and has uh, uh, skills, they deployed their machine there because they were sure they will have manufacturers. But now currently there is a lot of uh, uh, fight between China which I think if we continue to push, I am not saying we are going to have a fight with Europe, but uh, we can be able to solve our own problems because with this kind of technology, with this kind of knowledge, we can be able to do it. TVET is the key part to look at because any country which wants to grow, which wants to move faster, it needs to put effort in TVET institutions. That is uh, what Germany is doing uh, in double degree programs and double, what they call uh, double diploma, uh, so that the student at young age uh, can be able to go to industry. You, recently, with Jaffet, we organized the the skills mechatronics, which we trained the people from TV for 15 days, but they were able to operate the industrial machine after 15 days. So it means if you are able to do intensive training on this, you can be able to help the student. By that time, we are talking about the mechatronics, but now this time we are talking about this technology, TV institution, we can teach them how to operate their machine without necessarily them to leave their working stations. That is what we are trying to push and what that is what we think it can work better for them. Uh, I understand uh, Paris is saying uh, when we start virtual commissioning, but the question will be uh, start to, when we are starting, we need first of all, there is another, there is a phase of telling people this is possible. Uh, after this phase where people understand that this is possible from different sectors, uh, understand that this is not made for engineers, this is made for everyone, anywhere he's seated working. 
I don't believe there is anybody who doesn't want to buy uh, a certain electronics where he is. Whether you buy a phone, whether you buy anything you wanted to buy, but you need to operate it before it, you pay the money. Because I think uh, this can start to each individual. Uh, if you want something, somebody must demonstrate how it works so that you give your money when you are sure. Otherwise, most of the time when you buy things, maybe from Jumia or from other website, they reach to us and you say, ah, this is not what I wanted. But since you have paid, you have no much choice because you have already paid. So my proposal, uh, I am inviting you to be our ambassador of the technology. Uh, keep telling your friend, I will share you with you information. Uh, you can follow me on the LinkedIn, you can follow me on the Facebook, you can follow me on Twitter and other places. Most of the time I am active on Facebook and the LinkedIn and on Twitter because Twitter require me to keep tweeting, but uh, LinkedIn, when I post, I can uh, post and sleep. But importantly for me, if somebody related to me, before I sleep, I make sure that uh, I answer people who has sent message to me asking me questions. I can uh, give me my phone number, I can write my phone here, so that anybody who wants yes, to have my that phone- That be very useful. In fact, one is- 0627. One is six, one, if, let me don't remove the code. Uh, zero yes. And Mwangi has a question, he has sneaked in. So I think Mwangi, you can actually contact Professor. Uh, on I your don't page. know why it, I am not able to comment why. I, okay, zero seven, I think I don't know why I'm not able to send a comment. Oh, to send my, I mean it to, to send it the phone in the chat. Because oh, okay, is, I can do that. Let me, let me get the number. Maybe no you problem. can. Yeah, you can get the number and you post it. Somebody was asking okay. another question. Yes, Mwangi had the last question. Are you able to see it in the in the Zoom chat? No, please tell me what I need to do if I have developed yes. IoT at home, incorporating it to solve uh, pro common problems. Uh, if you developed IoT, for example, IoT device, uh, that is what maybe Mwangi is saying. Uh, I see he's talking about we need to have a house, uh, would have idea to. So this IoT uh, uh, technology, we have a center here where we help people to, we have a center of electronics or electronic, we call it electronics de uh, design. So somebody like Mwangi, I can introduce you to uh, my former, co he, was my co he was one of my staff, but now he he's saving the center. So he's my colleague as my staff as well. I can connect you with him and then he can help you uh, how to, you can be able to use uh, the device you have developed because they are making uh, circuit boards. So if you want to do it commercially, because currently they are using those devices for maybe, for example, water meter within a, within a wasco or other companies which distribute water, they have made the speed governor for the cars, the Matatus is commercial there. So all of them are based on the IoT, those are your IoT uh, devices. They have the circuit board, but with uh, your, some IoT uh, boards. So what I can say for you, if I connect you with them, you can easily uh, find your way. Uh, I don't know Mwangi whether I, am, I have answered you. I will communicate, you can get my phone, you engage me, then tomorrow, tomorrow, uh, I mean the next week, you, I can connect you with my friend and then you can, uh, we can see how we can go with those products. I we have many collaborators from industries. I had another person from Nairobi also who talked about IoT, how can we can make uh, the use commercial for them. So yeah. Mwangi, uh, uh, it is yes, good yes. you have my phone and then we can communicate. Is it okay, Mwangi? I see you say these answers. Huh? Uh, are you still looking for answer, Mwangi? Although I think face-to-face -face discussion. Yes, as I said, Mwangi, we are dead and Kimadi. You have my phone. If uh, you, we can organize how you can visit the lab and discuss with my colleague, because as I said, for me, I am a bit of it on uh, the, te the, the technology as a service than to produce it, but we have the, the lab for electronic design, which the one of the staff was my former staff in the, in the Siemens Center, but now I said it is better because I keep receiving requests like yours, 
uh, so that we had to start an electronic design so that when a student has an innovation, we can be able to give him space so that he can you not know, a space student necessarily even any other person who is not a student. Uh, in companies especially, they are interested in those kind of technologies. Thank you, Mr. Mwangi. Thank you so much. Uh, you've been quite generous with your knowledge today and uh, Mwangi says he will visit the lab, so that is good. Yeah, All you right. are most welcome, yeah. Yeah, so maybe you can give us your closing remarks and then we finish. <laughs> yeah, uh, I am very happy. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it is interesting. Uh, it is also important when you have somebody who allowed to listen, who accepted to listen to you because uh, we don't take this for granted because uh, it is not everybody who will give one hour and a half to listen to what you are saying or what you are telling him, uh, whether he's in the area or he's not in the area. Uh, but to me, I really appreciate your effort. You follow me on, uh, uh, if you go to the website, you will, it will direct you also. Every time I post something, I, I follow to our, I put also to our website and uh, our page. So that uh, nowadays there is a good method, as I said, when we communicate, when you call me one, two time, uh, Mark Zuckerberg will propose you on Facebook to invite me. He, that is how the data works. So you can be able to be my friend on Facebook or my friend on LinkedIn. Then we can start to communicate in any zone. We have many zones here, what we do are uh, different things. So even if you are from school of business, you are from any school, you can write it to me. You tell me the ideas, what do you want to work together to discuss with? Because these are the technology we are talking about and we need the technology to reach to everyone. So in a nutshell, thank you so much uh, for your time and for listening to me. This is really a chance I cannot take for granted. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, everyone, and have a good evening. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. All right, bye. All right.